Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews Signature Series. From musicians to painters, from novelists to filmmakers, we're bringing you a diverse range of voices and perspectives, all united by their passion for their craft. And whether you're a longtime fan or a newcomer to their work, we're confident that you'll learn something and find something to inspire and captivate you in each and every one of our interviews. So join us as we journey across borders and cultures, discovering new and exciting talents and celebrating the power of art and entertainment, which brings people together. Today on the show, we welcome American novelist Harriet Helfand. Harriet, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you, Chris. Thanks for asking me. So, Harriet, I, let's get the first question out of the way because uh, I want to get this on the record. Your books are titled under your pen name, H.C. Hefland, but you want me to introduce you as Harriet. What's the, what's the story behind uh, the name on the book compared to the name that I'm seeing on your Zoom call? <laughs> Well, my name is Harriet, and uh, to be honest with you, I probably wouldn't have chosen it, but my parents did, and here I am. <laughs> but um, the reason that I use my initials, and H.C. Helfand is my name, um, it is um, essentially because uh, I, uh, well, there are two reasons, sort of. Um, but prior to writing this novel, I wrote a children's book with a friend who's an, an artist and illustrator. And it was, we were really fortunate. There's a whole story behind it that I won't go into, but it was very well received. It was traditionally published. Um, it got very favorable reviews. And I swore after it, I would never write another children's book because it was the hardest thing I ever wrote. I'm just not cut out. It was very difficult, but it, but it turned out very nicely. And um, as I've told many people, the art sold the book. It's a beautiful book. And my, I used my full name on it, as did my partner, the artist. So when I went to um, write my novels, I wanted to distinguish myself from the children's book because I really considered myself an adult writer. So that was one of the reasons I used my initials rather than my full name. And I think partly too, because I think my initials are androgynous. And I guess I had a concern that you know, is someone going to see a woman's name and think chiclet? I don't know, maybe that's unfair of me, but I just wanted to sort of have a blank slate playing field when I released my book. So there wouldn't be any, you know, sort of, you know, predetermination of what the book might have been about. So I'm comfortable using my initials, but, um, you know, you can call me by my name. <laughs> awesome. So Harriet, before we talk about the book, A Fee, Simple, Conditional, and the uh, second book in the series, Clear and Convincing Evidence, I want to ask the question, where did your desire to write books come from? Oh, well, I think like many writers, I've always wanted to be a, wanted to be a writer, and I have cons always considered that to be my primary goal in life. And I've written since I was a child. Um, I wrote stories, I wrote little books and illustrated them. I, I was thinking about this. Uh, I think when I was in grade school, I wrote a play and my dad, who was actually a sports writer, uh, typed it up for me. We made a script, my class, you know, things like that. I was the dubious uh, honor of being the poetry editor of my literary magazine in school. <laughs> you know, I wrote awful poetry, but um, I always wanted to write. And I think that was, you know, I always had this inspiration and I always had this desire and aspiration. And um, I started Fee Simple um, Conditional a long, long time ago, but I just never had the, uh, what I consider to be the time and the impetus to complete it. But I always wrote during my career in various ways. I wrote essays, some of which were published in different, um, you know, different types of independent publications and, in my, for the past, uh, say, 20 some years, I did a tremendous amount of legal writing. So I've always been a writer, but this is my opportunity to do the kind of writing I always wanted to do. So writing legal briefs and writing a adult fiction like Fee Simple Conditional and Clear and Convincing Evidence are two different unique beasts in itself. Um, I want to talk about the writing style of the adult fiction author that I'm talking to right now, because in this book, and actually I'm going to start this, I'm going to start this line of questions with this. This is the great thing about my show. I can make up the questions on the fly. Um, I want to start with this Harriet. 
for those who haven't read Fee Simple Conditional and the second book, Clear and Convincing Evidence, give us a brief explanation of what this book is about. These books are about, I should say. Well, um, you know, it's so funny because people ask me the genre. I really don't know the genre. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think the default genre is literary fiction. But the, the book, it's, it's, a fiction, it's a fictional account of um, what I considered a, sort of a slice of a culture that I wanted to preserve. I had worked in this culture and I had met many, many people. And uh, as I describe in the book, quirky people. So what the book is about is about the experience of an individual. And this is a character that I created and um, how she enters this culture. And it's the culture of um, title searching that is um, researching the, uh, the history of land for purchase. And um, I'm sure it's done sort of wherever property is purchased and you have to check the many records going back through time to make sure that the title is clear and um, the group of people who do it. So she enters this world, it describes the people she meets, um, things happen in her life and how the the effect of that culture, how she finds something that leads her to discover something unusual about the, the world of titles and unusual about herself. I don't know if that- captures. No, it does. So the main character, Abigail Fisher, mm -hmm. um, you talk about in that statement just there about how this story is about kind of you a little bit, because with the color of her personalities and the, and the story of what she's doing, is this life imitating art? Is there people in this book that are out there reading this going, hey, that's me, isn't it? <laughs> well, I tried, uh, yes and no. Um, yes, in that um, I had a tremendous amount of inspiration and many of those stories are based on truth, true events. Um, but I mean, they're also embellished. But what's funny and um, is that I am not Abigail Fisher. You know, it's not my life, but I tried to write it through her eyes. But I did have a very dear friend of mine who read the book. And when she was talking to me about it, she said, and you did this and you did that in the book. And I said, no, not me, my character. <laughs> so we are distinguishable. But, um, but, a lot of, but a lot of the characters are based on, you know, real life occurrences that, that were kind of crazy, but they really happened in that world. You, you talk about uh, the, the not uh, Abigail's not you, but you paint in this book a picture that it makes you feel like this has happened to someone that you've known. And I say that because when I was reading this, I, I know it was a work of fiction, but I'm like, this is real life. This is something that could have happened in a time frame and in a period where this was actually going on. How did you get to write that well? Because I'm not trying to blow smoke up your butt here, but this is one of the best pieces of fictions that I've read. And I've gone, this does not feel like a fiction. This feels like a biography. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you. That's quite a compliment. And unfortunately, I don't have an answer. <laughs> I mean, I just kind of write. I mean, I think about my characters all the time. In fact, it's probably a little unhealthy, but um they really do kind of possess me. And I think about them, I think about what they say to each other, I think about how the, the trajectory of their lives. And even though, you know, a lot of the story is based on actual events and things that happen, um, you know, some of the interactions between the characters, of course, are made up. But a lot of things are real, the deed is real. The, the deed at the end where, um, you know, the, the in which the title is based, the fee simple conditional. There really was a deed like that that I found many years ago and kind of put it in the back of my head that it just made such an impression on me because it was so unusual. It was one of those, well, what if this happened, you know, in another circumstance? And I think that was one of the sort of the, the that, was, that was an impetus to creating this story. You've written the second book, Clear and Convincing Evidence, which is the second in the book series of the Arcadia Chronicles. I just wanted to make sure I got that right here because I kept on saying it backwards in our my pre-interview with myself, mm -hmm. um, the Arcadia Chronicles. So talk to me about what, what uh, Clear and Convincing Evidence picks up on 
after fee and simple condition. No. Okay, well, it continues the story of Abigail Fisher and David Armacost, and they are the main drivers of the story. Okay. Um, so uh, without giving too many spoilers, <laughs> I have some hints at the end of uh, Fee Simple Conditional where um, Abigail kept being teased about going to law school and she kept denying it, denying it, I'm not gonna do it, it's ridiculous. Well, guess what? <laughs> She does. <laughs> there she goes to law school. <laughs> right. So she does. And but after that, um, what does she do? And what she does is she, she becomes um, she joins the Office of the Public Defender and she joins the unit that conducts cases um, representing patients in psychiatric hospitals in involuntary admissions hearings. So as you can imagine, there are quite a few stories that evolve from that. And in addition to that experience, it's also her life story with David and uh, her, her, uh, some of the characters from the previous book, Ted and Raul, they show up to, they're prominent in the book. And, and there are a lot of other, you know, some new characters. She finds out some more information about her family that she never knew. And it just sort of takes them forward in their lives. And that's kind of where it goes. So I want to talk about character development because I, while I talk about when I, I kind of said in their previous statement there that you read this book and it reads like a biography, you paint a picture of each one of these characters that you get connected with. Like the reader is connected with the, the, uh, the character that you're describing and you feel like you're there in person with them. For you, how important is it for character development in stories like this, in books like this, and in sequels? Thank you. I don't know if I've ever thought of that, but thank you. I think it must be very important to me because obviously I wanted to emulate that. And you emulate and it quite well, FYI, because I've read some books where I go, hmm. And then this book, I'm like, okay, I like Ted. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, part of what I, maybe part of it is that, uh, you know, when I said I had some obsessions with my characters, when I think about them, I think about how they would approach a scene and what they would say and what they would, you know, their feelings about what was going on in the scene. And maybe that's part of it. That is it hard? To, is it hard to put yourself into other people's uh, 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 shoes in some essence? Because uh, I'm not spoiling anything. You're a woman mm -hmm. and uh, you're writing uh, great dialogue and great descriptions of men's perspectives. And I'm going, OK, Something's going on here. She's able to connect with all her characters. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure how much of a an effort I make of that, but I do try to get. If into this is not effort, yes. I want to. Yeah. I want to say something. This is the best non-effort I've ever read. Then. <laughs> well, I, I just mean that I, I really try to get into them, and I worry about that too. It's like, how can you know, I've never had the experience of being a man, obviously, at this point in my life. And how, what would this character, how would they react to this? What would they say? What would they think? And I actually put a lot of thought into it. And, and I worry about whether I, I'm right. You know, am I, um, am I actually capturing that character? And is it, is it meaningful? Is it superficial? Do I really understand what somebody in this position would say or think? So I do put a lot of thought into it and um, it's, um, you know, I'm not sure if I ever feel real secure about it, but I really appreciate what you're saying. It means well, a lot. Oh, Harriet, I, 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 like I said, I, I fell in love with this book. I'm very much looking forward to book yeah, number two. You. But I want to talk about the independent, the independent mm -hmm. author now, because this is an independently published book. And while you did say earlier on in our interview that you did go the traditional route in a past author life as a children's author, you chose the independent route, route for this. What was the, the reasoning behind that? Because I could imagine, like, this seems like something like Simon & Schuster or Penguin Books uh, would pick up. So why did you chose, choose the uh, independent route? Well, thanks. Um... I think in the beginning, I just always envisioned doing it myself because I didn't really know how to do anything else. I mean, I didn't know how to do that either, 
but I just was never connected with the publishing world or any kind of formal writing or writing instruction. And it never, I just didn't know the process, number one. Number two, after sort of discovering what that was, after I had written the book and published it, I mean, one of my, one of the reasons was I wanted to do it in my lifetime. You know, I know a lot of, I mean, I, I know that sounds facetious, but I know a lot of writers who are wonderful writers, writers who are so much better than I am, who spend years querying. And then once you've queried, you found an agent. And then, you know, the agent has to sell it. And it can take an awfully long time. And even though I think there are great advantages, there can be great advantages to that. I didn't want to take, I didn't know, if, number one, I didn't know if I had that time. And number two, I didn't want to take that time. I just wanted to do it. And that's basically why I did it. And this, um, is, did, this is a book that took some time to write because you talked, uh, for those who are listening, who might not know, uh, Harriet and I, uh, we got to know each other on another show, uh, an author round table. And in that, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Harriet, this book started a few years ago, and it wasn't until 2020, 2021, when the pandemic hit, that it really took off for you. And that's that's true. I started it. Um, I, I did, you know, just like Abigail Fisher, title searching for many years. And what, as I said, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because that that culture was disappearing. Now it, it really doesn't exist anymore. It's all done electronically. Nobody goes to the record office anymore. So I wanted to preserve it. So I started this book and then I kind of changed careers. I started doing another kind of legal work. And I put it aside because I didn't think I'd have time for it, but I wrote sort of a bare bones outline because I didn't want to forget the way I wanted to continue with the book. And then, like you said, when, you know, the pandemic started and a little bit before I thought, you know what, now or never, do it. Who knows what the future will bring? And, uh, you know, it's funny, I mentioned my dad was a writer. And I remember my father saying that he had written a play, but he never finished it. And I thought, I don't want that to be me. I want to I want to finish this. I need to complete this for the sort of the satisfaction of my life and getting, you know, getting this work out. So I did independently publish it, which is sort of a miraculous thing because I'm not very tech savvy. And it's totally it was totally DYI. I mean, I just, you know, follow the directions step by step. Um, the photograph on the cover I took with my iPhone. What? I mean, it's crazy. I I literally thought that was a painting. That's oh, my oh. Well, my eyes aren't the best to begin with. That's I, but it looked like I thought it was a painting at first because I thought someone had painted that. So that shows you how much I was paying attention. But it was an iPhone. Well, that's photo. okay. It was, and it actually, what happened? It was enhanced because for my original, I actually that cover was. Um, I, I since since I've started writing, I uh, you know writing these books. I tried to do a lot of research into independent publishing, writing, you know, all the stuff that I never knew before. And one of the things that was a prominent and made an impression on me was advice from independent authors to A, get a professional cover and B, get a professional editor. So I thought my cover before was I mean, I liked the picture and everything. I thought the picture was very reflective of the story, but I didn't like the graphics. I thought they looked a little amateur-ish. So I contacted someone who had been recommended by another independent author and she spruced up the cover. And that's the one you see with the dark writing. And I think she enhanced the colors, but it definitely was a photograph I took on my phone. And, um, and it really is a place that's in Arcadia. Um you you talk about the fact that you wanted to publish this because you, you kind of didn't want to be like your father who didn't publish his play that moment when you press publish and it goes out into the world and as an author your child is leaving the house in some essence what was that experience like for you to finally put this to bed and say okay i've gotten it i'm happy with it i'm content i'm putting it out there for people to now read and potentially judge how hard was that for you it was probably more exhilarating. <laughs> it's very exciting to do it. I will tell you that the, the moments that I find really moving are writing the final portions of the book. You know, almost even more than hitting that publishing, because once you hit the publishing button, I think it's more nerve wracking. Like, did I make, a, did I make any mistakes? 
text? Is, any, is everything going to come out right? Fortunately, um, I, I published through KDP and you order proof copies, which I go through with a fine tooth comb. Thank goodness they do that. But finishing the book to me is a very emotional experience. So, um, you know, that I've sort of gone through the emotion, but the publishing is sort of, it's a combination of fear and relief. So, um, but, but it's pretty momentous to be able to do that for, for, for your creation. We, we talked about Fee Simple Conditional. We've talked about clear and convincing evidence. You've got two books out there, which the links to the books will be in the show notes. So for anyone who's watching this, scroll down. The Canadian links and the U.S. links will be in the show notes to pick up copies, both of these copies, and I highly recommend this. But what's next? What's next now? Is book Is there a book three in the works, or is there a new storyline that's coming out? What's next for Harriet? Well, there is a book three. And in the beginning, when I wrote Fee Simple Condition, when I was in the process of writing it, I really didn't envision it being a series. I thought, you know, it was going to end when it ended. And then towards, you know, finishing it and, you know, without giving it away, there's a, there's a final portion of it called the coda, which I actually wrote long after, I, or not long after, but after I finished the book. And that is very different from the rest of the book, but I, it just kind of came to me. And to me, it, it, I needed to put that in the story. And once I did that, I started thinking about the story from the viewpoint of the other main character, David Armacost. And then I thought, but this story has to continue because I, I had captured, I felt her voice, but I really wanted to capture his voice. So what I've done in Clear and Convincing Evidence is the chapters they don't alternate exactly. It's not one for her and one for him, but I have chapters for each of them and each of their voices. They're written a little bit differently. Her voice is in first person um, and his is in third person on mission. But, um, but I really wanted to capture that different point of view. So once I started doing that, I thought, well, where do we go from here? And then I thought about other books that I've written and I became, so captivated with my characters' lives, I wanted to kind of see them through. So that's my vision for this series right now. Now, I'm not sure whether my aspirations will coincide with my ability to do that, but I am working on a third book. It's called The Rite of Redemption. And it does um, continue with these characters. And again, sort of like clear and convincing evidence, some of the same characters carry over. There are some new characters in the book. There are new circumstances. Um, and I do think my long, my long term vision, if I'm able to have one, is two other books to round out their lives. But we'll see. I've, I've planned them in a fairly perfunctory way. I don't know if it's going to get boring by then. People might, you know, I might get sick of them. They might get sick of me. <laughs> But um, that's where I am. And I'm also, um, in, yeah, I have, a, I have some, you know, a, a dear writing friend who has encouraged me to try to traditionally publish and to write a standalone novel to do that. Because I, um, I think it's very hard to try to traditionally publish something in a series where it's been independently published before. Yeah. So rather than try to do that, um, I do have a plan for a standalone book. And I don't know if I'm going to do that in between or at the end, depending, you know, how life goes. But I do have I do have a plan for one. And um, it's a little bare bones right now. But I, you know, try to write a little bit about it and we'll see. Um, I want to talk about the character because you just said something. <laughs> When you write characters like Abigail, like the characters in Fee and Simple Condition in the Arcadia Chronicles, do they kind of feel like your children at the end of the day? <laughs> like when you write them, like, are you going, mm -hmm. okay, I can't let this happen to this character because that would just hurt me. Like in, in that sense, <laughs> like when you like, does this feel, or does even the book feel like a part of you that it's hard to even put out there because while it's great to publish it is hard sometimes to hear the critiques that some people might have of a book or and you kind of uh, were cringing a little bit when i was giving you compliments by saying oh thank you it just seems like it was hard for you to put this out and then expect to not get good compliments with your writing abilities 
Oh, thanks. Um, you know, it's funny. I, not, right so much for, not so much my children, but like my best friends. You know, huh? it's like my imaginary friends. You know, <laughs> but I do. I mean, every so often, uh, I think at the very end of the book, you and this is this is just going to make me sound like a real nut, but. Um, Towards the end of the end of Fee Simple Conditional, one of the characters works at Johns Hopkins University. And I drive by there every so often. And I swear I saw him walking down the street. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Good job, Sarah. There, there's a, there is a realism to them that that where I do relate to them. And you know, for better or worse, I think about him a lot. And I'll just tell you about another thing that, you know, the character, that one of the characters that is totally made up out of whole cloth in um, clear and convincing evidence. Um, I was, uh, the character becomes a very prominent character in the book. Okay. And, and I'm not gonna give away spoilers, but I was uncertain as to sort of her future participation in books going forward. And I've had so many people say, well, what about her? Where's she going? Is she coming back? And I thought I better put her back in. So now she is a big part of that book and uh, we'll see where it takes us. What does it mean for you, people, uh, for an author like yourself, when you read reviews of your work and people have connected to it, like I've connected to your book, because I can imagine, uh, like when I read reviews of my stuff, I go, wow, people have actually taken time out of their day to either read their books or listen to my interviews. So for you, what is that experience like for you to know that you've made an impact, whether it be a small impact of someone reading your stuff or a big impact that someone's connected with your work? It's incredibly meaningful to me. It really is. I, I the, the feeling that I've gotten when I've read positive reviews is just, it's pretty indescribable. I guess maybe because it validates, you know, I feel validated as a writer, but also the fact that they, you know, it moved them, you know, and um, it, it's incredibly meaningful. And even if someone didn't, you know, I, I found that, you know, they might not have connected with the book as much as someone else did, but I've always felt like, you know, gratified, like you said, to that, that someone took the time to read it and also that they took the time to write, to write about it and to say something about it. But I've been very fortunate to have reviews that I've all found positive and encouraging. And I will tell you the first review I got, it just, I kind of broke down. It was just really, it, it was just overwhelming to me that this thing I had created had, um, you know, allowed someone and propelled somebody to have an emotional response. Harriet, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for doing this today. It was an honor to sit down with you. It was an honor to read your first book. I'm looking forward to when Amazon delivers book two, and I'm looking really forward to book three, The Rite of Redemption, later on, hopefully, maybe this year or 2024 or 2025, depending on when it hits bookshelves. But I want to thank you so much for sitting down and talking about your book today. Well, thank you, Chris. It's been a real honor for me, too. I mean, um, I'm just so delighted that you asked me to do this, and I'm grateful, and I um, hope you enjoy it. So, <laughs> so, with, well. so with that, I want to remind everyone, links to Fee and Simple Conditional and the clear and convincing evidence are in the show notes, so scroll down if you're watching this on YouTube and click on the links. Purchase the book, support independent authors like Harriet, and also, if you are an independent author and you want to come on and talk about your book or your music or anything, happy to reach out to me and I will love to have you on to talk about your book, your novel, your painting, your work. So with that, this has been the signature series of the Cross Border Interviews. Have yourself an excellent day, and remember everyone, just keep talking. <laughs>